All right, welcome back uh, to the Rap Regeneration Program. Uh, I'm Dave Escamilla. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not making any medical claims or claims about diseases. Um, neither is my guest. We are so honored uh, to have with us today from Growing Your Greens, from DiscountJuicers.com, from OK Raw, long time, decades long expert in many areas and speaker at Texas Fruit Festival, uh, Mr. John Kohler. Uh, John, thanks so much for, for being with us. Thanks for having me, David. I'm looking forward to coming out to the Fruit Festival next, and actually next month. <laughs> Yes, that's right. We're we're having the Fruit Festival um, October 19 and 20, Austin, Texas. Um, it is a free event, um, and there's going to be so much to do. Um, you can listen to speakers like John. Uh, there's going to be activities. There's a whole facility to explore and hang out at. So um, you can listen to speakers or activities or just meet people and amazing food. And um, so TexasFruitFestival.com. So we're gonna plug that and uh and John, we're we're excited to have you. Um, I guess before before we get into all that, I, I just for those who don't know John Kohler, uh as you know, gardening expert, natural health uh expert, someone who knows a lot about raw foods, whole foods, plant-based, um, take us back because I understand that when you were in your early 20s, you were diagnosed with spinal meningitis or you were told by doctors some really grave uh things about the state of your health so i mean people look at you now they're like wow look at john his skin's glowing he has all this energy he looks so young and and vibrant but take us back to that that dark moment what what was that like when you went through that and um and how did you kind of navigate that yeah, that was a diff difficult one there, David. So like back, I was just out of college, just had graduated college. I remember playing broom ball with my fraternity brothers. And actually the next day I got really sick. I had like flu-like symptoms and even ended up passing out. And my parents had to drive an hour to basically take me to the hospital where I that was like put, put in a wheelchair because I was I was like in and out of coherence. And then I, I remember just like waking up in the hospital with all these IVs stuck in me. My back was hurting and I'm like, what's going on? They're like, you're hospitalized. You have spinal meningitis and you might not make it out of here alive. And I'm like, what? I thought I just had the flu. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just definitely not a fun place to be because I had the viral version of meningitis. I mean, bacterial version, maybe they could have gave me antibiotics, but the viral version there's no cure right so this was not a fun place to be whatsoever and basically I was like I don't even know how long I was in the hospital a week or two or something like just trying to just trying to get through it and they were just pumping me full of IVs or whatever else and my mom was sitting at my bedside holding my hand like the whole time or something I was praying and then I was I had a lot of time to think I mean they had the crappy TVs they didn't have no internet back then <laughs> they had, maybe had cable TV but um, I was like, man, this is the last, I was, I had so many thoughts going through my head when I was sitting in the hospital. Like one of the thoughts was, man, this is the last thing I'm going to see in my life. Like I didn't get, I never got married, never had kids, never had a dog, never made the million dollars that I wanted to. Cause we're all raised like from a young age, like we need to make a lot of money and all this stuff. That's the life goal. And I was like, man, none of this has happened. And I thought to myself, is that stuff really important anyways? Even if I had a million dollars, would I still be in this situation? Could I write a check, Mr. Doctor, $1 million, do not cash unless John is still alive if he walks out of here? Otherwise, it's null and void. No, millionaires, trillionaires, bazillionaires, I don't know how much money people have these days, they lose their lives every single day because they don't take care of the most important thing. And this is what I realized in the hospital. And this is why I'm glad um, for the situation I was in when I was in my 20s. Because I really started valuing my health. Because at that point, when I was in the hospital, David, all I wanted, I didn't want a million dollars. Screw that. All I wanted was my health back. And so, I, I you know, one of the hmm. sayings is, you know, health is your greatest wealth. And I try to take that to heart. I'm not perfect, you know, but I try to take that to heart and do things and look in advance. Look, you know, what am, what, what am I going to be like in 10, 20 years from now? And what could I do today to influence my future health? 
you know, so I mean, this is the stance I took when I was, you know, younger in life. And in my opinion, it's definitely paid off. Um, another thing I really thought about is like, what do we, if we're not here for money, because we're supposed to accumulate all this money and it's supposed to buy you anything you want and provide all this happiness. And yeah, there's famous actors and people that have tons of money and then they commit suicide because it, it it's a false reality. <laughs> it's fake news you know? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but then i thought well what's really important then so then i you know i prayed and i can only say i'm here today through higher powers and i said that like, i made a promise like i'm like because i was raised religious and like one of the things in religion like different ways it's said but basically help thy fellow man you know so if we're really not here for 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 money to make money what are we going to do on the planet and like to help our fellow man or you know to live in service right so like i promise that like hey if i get out of this situation then i'm going to live my life in service and be able to share what i've learned with others that that healed me so that other people don't have to go through the same situation that i did so i mean i think those are the two main outcomes that i had from that event that i started valuing my health and that i want to live in service and and I didn't know how that what that was going to mean, because um, it wasn't necessarily revealed all at once. But I, you know, but because I had to like basically go to the school of hard knocks and learn about eating a fruit and vegetable based raw diet and learn about health from a young age. Because luckily, I got better only through higher powers. But the doctor said, "Hey, you could get a reoccurrence of this. You have what's called complement immune deficiency or a chronically weak immune system." So he blamed my my sickness illness on my genes and as i have since learned you know our genes may load the gun but our lifestyle pulls the trigger like it's called mm -hmm. epigenetics and and of course i've learned a lot of other things besides that since then so like i didn't want to take that their diagnosis that i have a bad immune system that i might get sick again i wanted to do something about it to ensure that i wouldn't be back in the hospital again and be in that same situation so i mean that's that simply is what i've done systematically and pragmatically over the, all these years which is now 29 years okay 29 years so um so you're how old now john so i, I never mentioned my age <laughs> okay, uh, publicly we, due to privacy reasons okay okay but we can do the math because if you were 22 and then it was 29 <laughs> wow so you're you're oh my god so you're over 50 Okay, well, I'm not you, mentioning no numbers, but you okay. Know. Do you use do you use skin moisturizer? The only thing I put on my face is jojoba oil. Okay, I think and that's I think, usually only before I make a video. <laughs> okay, I think uh, um, people that are listening to this, most people are listening to this, and not watch it, but on the podcast. But for those listen watching this, um, they would say, "Wow, I need to get John's." Well, wow, what was that? What was it? What do you put on the face? What's it called? Jojoba oil. But that's, but man, like you it's could put, stuff, you could slather it's stuff lifestyle. on the outside of your skin all you want, man. I think a, a lot of the reason for my healthy skin is what I put on the inside because our skin is not formed on the outside. It's formed on the inside and then comes out. So, yeah. I mean, that, I think that's very important. So, I mean, yeah, antioxidants are one thing, healthy fats are another thing you know, vitamin C, you want to be able to produce a lot of good collagen. And, you know, depending on what you're eating, like, you know, vitamin C, you want to eat regular vitamin C, like, you know, one of my favorite th things to eat is actually the bell peppers, which are higher in vitamin C than oranges. So actually this week, I'm e eating my pepper soup, which are basically like juice, like five pounds of bell peppers, which is five pounds of tomatoes. And then th that juice is blended up with nuts and seeds, herbs and spices. And then I basically go to my garden and which you can see behind me, I pick all kinds of different greens, chop them up and put them in there and then just eat that. So it's like a salad, but it's like smothered in the, you know, a, a light dressing because it's not like super fatty, but it's more soupy. But yeah. Wow. Um. So so you were in the situation and and basically these people were telling you you don't have control. This is outside of your control. And you you said, um, no, you know what? I'm going to take control and I'm going to. This is in my control. When we're in our early 20s, it's easy to take our health for granted, but you had that taken away from you. And so how did you, this was back in, you know, the 90s. I mean, how did you, how did you figure out what to do? Because nowadays you go on the internet, 
but how did you even figure out that you you could use superfoods and um, clean up what you were eating to, to to solve some of that? And what was that process like? I don't think there was any internet back then when I started, but um, <clears throat> I mean, it was a slow process because there was no internet. <laughs> so basically I didn't really know what I was gonna do. I, I you know, um, I always read my ingredient labels. Even at that point, I wasn't eating red meat. You know, I'd quit drinking at 21. But I think for me, um, it, it just happened kind of by happenstance. I was kind of lucky, actually. So, uh, like, in 1995, I was living out in Birmingham, Alabama, and watching TV late night because I, like, moved in with these college guys that I was hanging out with. And I, I saw an infomercial from uh, Jay Cordich, known as the Juice Man. And I don't know why I was watching that, but, like, it really kind of sucked me into the infomercial. And the one thing that he said in the infomercial was, you know, something extent of that like juicing can improve your immune system so when he said that i'm oh. like ding 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 i need to improve my immune system i need to get a juicer because i didn't know what the heck to do i didn't go to school for for nutrition or nothing and so then i bought the juicer off the infomercial and unlike today of two-day amazon delivery prime or maybe even one day depending on your service area you know they're like the juicer is going to be there in two weeks and I'm like what i can't wait two weeks so then i went actually down to walmart and as luck would have it walmart had a juicer on clearance sale for like i don't know 27 88 or whatever they're charging i brought it home and i started juicing like the juice man and then it started like smoking the motor and like it broke and then i had to return it and as luck would have it they had one extra one one left so then i got that one and then i started juicing when that same thing happened i'm like oh these are cheap juicers so then i started learning from it from a young age that like hey there's cheap juicers and there's good juicers and then i got his juicer and then i was putting all the stuff that he shows in the you know infomercial and it worked great hmm. and then and then so that was my first step so just drinking fruit and vegetable juice which i still do <laughs> to this day <laughs> right here wow. um very important part of how i how, how i live my life uh this is my second court today and it's actually only 10 30 <laughs> but um but yeah so that was the first step and then also with his juicer you got 10 cassette tapes so that like really dates me there you're like what's a cassette tape <laughs> oh. <laughs> but anyways with the cassette tapes you know he talked about different things so on like the first cassette tape he th he said something i'll never forget he said the one thing that ages you prematurely faster than anything else is cook foods don't put cooked foods in your body. And when I heard that, I'm like, this dude's a whack job. Everybody I know eats cooked foods. Nobody eats only raw foods. I'm not going to listen to that. I flip the tape over and hit re rewind and hit play. And then he'd say, oh, try, you know, parsley, dandelion, celery, carrot, apple for your health or something, you know, and all these other recipes he'd give. So, but that stuck, that stuck in my brain, you know, cooked foods ages you prematurely. Hmm. Now, Knowing what I know now, after living this lifestyle and doing lots of research, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but I would say most cooked foods that people commonly eat does age you prematurely. <laughs> okay. But there's select cooked foods that not all cooked foods are bad is really my main message. But I go deep right. into this on my OK Raw channel. It's, it's very nuanced, and I'm really against kind of some of the raw food dogma that's out there that some people teach, unfortunately. Well, let, let's let's talk about that for a second. Um but, but real quick before we do, what did your housemates think of this at the time when you started doing all this juicing and what what did they think? Oh, I, I've had crazy. Yeah. So like I was living with two rednecks in Alabama at the time. And then I was pretty cool because I'd still I'd still I basically would juice for breakfast and I juice for my mid afternoon snack and I would still eat, you know, whatever clean, you know, I mean, they would eat red meat. I still wouldn't eat red meat. I might have some chicken you know, or something back then when I was just getting into it. And that's that. And then six months later, that's when I really went on a cleanse and stuff and then got it all out. But uh, yeah, they thought it was interesting, or especially when I came back to, to California, my roommates there just thought I was crazy because now I was basically living on juices. And that's when I did transition to eating raw vegan. And then, I mean, I, it, and then my parents were even worse. They're like, my mom was a librarian. So she was trying to convince me to just eat some cooked foods i'm like no mom i'm going all raw it's for my health <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well so talk talk to us about about cooked foods because um 
you know, I hear raw vegan and raw foods, uh, you know, used as a term a lot. But when I look at the population of human beings, maybe one in 10,000 people is eating a raw food, completely raw vegan diet. So, um, you know, so it just seems like, what about the other 9,999 people? Um, so talk to us about a combination of using raw raw foods and whole uh, plant-based foods. And what, what's your what's your point of view about that? And, you know, what, what can people use as accessible advice that, that they, they can actually implement or, or what, what do you find works for you in, in terms of um, some, some cooked food and some raw food or, or what's your, what's your perspective? Sure. So my perspective is number one, I'd say if we look at the blue zones, right? How many blue zones are all entirely raw vegan? <laughs> like no, none of them, they, everybody, everybody in a blue zone does eat some cooked food or heat processed food, as I like to call it. And some of them could live very long lives. Now, yeah, diet is one part of the reason why they live very long. And many of them also garden, <laughs> get good amounts of exercise and don't have all the stress level that we do have in modern life. But that's aside from the point. So, I mean, I think an entirely raw vegan diet, it, you know, could work for some people. I haven't seen people have extraordinary long lives from raw vegan with few exceptions there there's exceptions out there um and you know longevity it, to me is is part of health for sure um that being said you know i mean i am st strictly against most cooked foods that are out there including a lot of vegan cooked foods um you know so like i'm, I'm a totally different cookie because i've kind of come up with my own ideas based on the science and based on testing and experimenting on myself. So, you know, I still highly believe that raw foods are very beneficial and that most Americans actually need to eat a heck of a more lot of raw foods because most people simply don't. And one of the reasons why raw foods is good, and I have a whole video on all the reasons why raw food is good is because it's minimally processed. You're pretty much just picking leaves and greens like I was picking moringa out of my garden this morning and snacking and stuff. Um, and just eating it without any processing. And the big problem is the processed food, the ultra processed food that people are eating, you know, that are, are just deranging the food and making like literally people crazy. I mean, there's books written on this subject, the crazy makers, but, um, but I think there are healthy heat processed foods, but it's not something you're going to be able to go out and get at any restaurant for the most part, in my opinion, because I mean, I'm so like these days I eat 70 to 90% raw maybe some days there's even a hundred percent just depends on the day. Some days I don't really even desire any heat processed food. Um, just really depends on that day and what I'm eating. Like lately it's summertime. So I've been eating lots of fruits and kind of my fruit consumption has gone up and my, you know, uh, heat processed starch consumption has gone down. But I also don't believe these days in being too extreme. You know, I think that for every, every, every time you eat a food, you have an opportunity you know, you have an opportunity to improve your health or decrease your health. Some people on a fruit-based diet may think, might think, hey, if I just pound in more oranges and eat a mono meal of oranges, I'm going to increase my health. In my opinion, if you eat a lot of oranges, that's great. You're getting a lot of the nutrients in oranges. But how many, how many nutrients from the oranges does your body need? And at some point now you've oversaturated the specific nutrients in oranges that you're eating. So now that your body is just basically flushing them out. When if you ate like half oranges and maybe even just half blueberries, now you got two different different kinds of nutrients in each of those, and then you could eat a section of those, or maybe even do three, do you know, oranges, blueberries, and strawberries, or maybe you want to do blueberries, oranges, strawberries, and then have a little bit of you know, cooked beans or something, you know, and now you're getting different fibers and nutrients in the beans, you know. So spreading it out instead of these more you know, just a single single item because you're missing an opportunity for other nutrients that are in other foods besides just oranges, besides having mangoes, besides just having whatever that mono meal fruit is. And I mean, in a bigger picture, I see that, hey, raw foods is great. It limits your diet down to eating mostly fruits and vegetables, maybe some nuts and seeds if you're eating nuts and seeds, maybe some sprouted grains and and, and beans, the ones that can be sprouted and eaten without killing you or getting you sick. Um, so it's a very restrictive diet, in my opinion. So by being able to heat process some of my foods, once again, small percentage, 10 to 20, maybe up to 30 sometimes, 
I'm able to, you know, eat a wider range of foods. And, you know, with the new new studies of microbiome coming out, you know, one of the things that always comes through is they want you to eat 30 different kinds of plants a week, which you could do on a raw vegan diet. It'd be hard for some people to do that. But when you're starting to heat process food, you know, you could eat foods that weren't accessible otherwise. So, you know, some beans, once again, and rice could be eaten raw, um, but I could steam those. And then also we could talk about resistant starches. So now I have benefits of resistant starches. Um, so, yeah, so things I heat process are only in the instant pot because as a raw vegan, my stove is still disconnected, used for storage. Um, and that's the only way I recommend heating if you do want to cook your food because that does it at the lowest temperature. So you're not creating carcinogens and making food pro-oxidative and going to age you. And, you know, meanwhile, some some raw vegans would say all cooked food is bad. And I would I, I would say, you know, instead, most cooked foods are bad and all ultra processed foods are bad. I'm eating a very simple whole food. Just like like last night, for example, I had like just steamed, you know, potatoes. Uh, sweet potatoes, you know, was was my cooked food I ate yesterday. Otherwise, my day was actually all raw. Oh, I did. Oh, actually, I did have some purple rice and some navy beans that were also cooked in the instant pot in water to keep the temperature below 240 degrees, so you don't create carcinogens when you're heat processing. Wow. So we're we're talking with John Kohler um, from OK Raw and. As you can hear, there's a lot of nuances to this. People throw around yeah. terms like cooked versus raw. I mean, within cooked, you have all these levels and all these different methodologies of changing that chemistry that are way different than others. And so um, if you want to uh, find out more in more detail, look up John's YouTube channel, OK Raw. Um, he goes into great detail about his process of preparing foods and um you know, I would consider John an expert also on on produce specifically. Um, I want to find out your take on conventional versus organic. Um, you know, do you what's what's your perspective on that right now uh, as we look at that? So, I mean, <laughs> I have a problem with both conventional and organic because I, I just have a general problem problem with the industry, the produce industry as a whole. Because the produce industry as a right, tell whole... Tell us. Take the gloves off, John. Tell us. <laughs> yeah, bam. Um, you know, I mean, once again, just like any industry, they're out there for to make a profit. They're out there to make money. You know, when, when the farmer in the produce industry and these big mega farms that are growing monocultures, are they thinking, hey, I want David in Austin to have the best quality, most nutritious, highest phytochemical antioxidant and best tasting peach he's ever eaten in his freaking life and he's going to orgasm when he eats it no i don't think that at all <laughs> they think how can i get david the peach so that he buys it with his money and i don't really and, and, and it still looks good because as long as it looks good <laughs> he'll buy it and even if it tastes like crap has a mealy texture because the peach has been put in cold storage because they don't have multiple temperatures of refrigerated trucks they have one temperature and especially with peaches if it gets too cold, it gets cold damage, and then they, they never ripen up, and then they get all this mealy texture, which I'm sure many viewers have, have seen this. So it's like, I don't know, the produce industry is just out there to make a buck, and I'm not the biggest fan, so I encourage you guys, like you can see behind me, this is my garden from this year. It's about about it's about 30 days be be ago, so now it's a lot taller. But literally the ones on these si this side is called... Uh, water spinach this was planted literally about 60 days ago from when this photo is taken i mean when wow. i planted them they were this tall and i have a video on that on my gardening channel and then in, in 60 days man there's just like more food than i could even eat so i mean this is how easy it is to grow your food yet everybody is enslaved to going to the grocery store to buy their food when you could you could grow your own or you can go wild harvest things right and there's so many things that are easy. And like, honestly, I mean, I live in Vegas. It's the second hottest city in the United States after maybe Phoenix. And even, I mean, it, like almost three months, it's like over 100 degrees. We hit a world's record, I think, of 120 degrees. So it, everything in my garden was over 118 degrees. So what, if I eat something out of my wow. garden, am I automatically cooked because it's over 118 degrees? <laughs> <laughs> No, man, because the plants, you know, they, they take up the water and they they tr transpire like we perspire to cool us down. And, 
you know, the enzymes are still alive in my plants. Otherwise, they wouldn't be alive. But nonetheless, I really want to encourage people to grow their own. And then after that, if they can't grow their own to get out of the whole produce industry, go visit your local farmer's market. You know, talk to your farmers, get to know them. So at least you're buying local. This is going to be also usually much higher quality than the industry can provide you. And of course, you know, so that's what I do. Actually, I eat out of my garden primarily. I see what's in season, what I can harvest, what I can make out of it. And then I go to local farms. My normal shopping days, two Tuesdays, I go to the two, I visit two farms every week during the season, buy stuff from them. And then I eat my stuff, their stuff. And then if I still don't have enough, enough food to eat, then I'll go and buy organic food, you know, just from okay. the industry. So I think really this is a much more sustainable way to live. And also it's going to ensure you're going to get a higher quality food, which means you're going to be a higher quality person because unfortunately in, in the raw foods movement, there's not many people that talk about produce quality. And I think there needs to be a lot more um, because I mean, if like, if I, if I grow the same lettuce out of my garden, I could eat like, I don't know, half a head of lettuce. Meanwhile, if I buy it from the store and I'm satisfied after like a half a head of lettuce, if I go to the store, I got to eat two heads of lettuce to get the same satiety. That's because, you know, the lettuce I'm growing has a lot more minerals and different phytochemicals because I'm usually growing purple or red lettuces in the store. You know, you might actually, I did buy iceberg yesterday to go, go in my juice, but you're getting romaine and it's significantly different levels of the phytochemicals, which I believe to have a lot of ben human benefit and one of the re many reasons why the raw vegan diet works. So, I mean, making your your short answer too long, unfortunately, which is what I do a lot, it, uh, saying just so if we just had to choose between conventional and organic, I'll say each have their own pros and cons. And I would encourage people whenever possible and practical to buy organic because two reasons mainly. Number one, you will be avoiding absolutely man-made synthetic pesticides. And you could get, you know, you could get too much residual pesticide load in your body, and that can cause disease as shown in published studies. You can look up Environmental Working Group, the Dirty Dozen, and the Clean 15. That's what specifically they go into. I, I have a video on my OK Raw channel where I go even deeper than EWG because I go into the data that the US government or USDA provides on the sprays on specific produce items. So we could see how many times, like if you buy cilantro, I think cilantro was one of the worst things you could buy uh, conventionally grown because in general it's sprayed a lot. And that's what, you know, and then it actually the, the study that I got into showed like imported versus domestic produce. And actually it showed like domestic produce, like I think for, especially I think was it for fruits? were sprayed even more than imported produce, hmm. which was kind of crazy. But nonetheless, we want to stop eating these man-made chemicals, petrochemicals that can build up and accumulate in our bodies, you know, some of which, yeah, may not be able to be easily detoxified, such as PFAS. Um, so that's number one. The number two reason why I'd say to go for organic is because in general, but not always, there are uh, usually more higher levels of plant phytochemicals. So plant phytochemicals are say like the lycopene in tomatoes, you know, or the different kind of color pigments in the leaves. And these are basically nutrition for us. So like there's more antioxidants uh, in there, I guess is a, is a simple way if you don't understand all these complex things uh, to say it, because basically what happens is like all the plants behind me, like I don't spray any chemicals on them. You know, in the forest, you think, okay, how does everything in the forest grow when there's no men spraying fertilizer or, you know, spraying, you know, Roundup or pesticides on the forest? Do, do bugs eat the forest? No, we have a full forest. That's because the plants have over thousands of years created their own immune system, their own defense system to prevent the bugs in their area from eating them. And these okay. are the plant phytochemicals that we call phytonutrients that are beneficial for us. So like anthocyanins, which make different leaves, uh, you know, the purple or reddish color or what plants produces. So like now these plants that are red color, like this morning, I filmed a video of my false roselle, which are actually red leaves. You know, think about it. Red leaves burn a lot less than green leaves or leaves that are kind of like light yellow. Because it's like just like people that are light skin or dark skin. Dark skin people don't burn as bad. So they have more you know, melanin it easily. The melanin, and yeah. But so these anthocyanin compounds in the plants don't allow them to burn as much and give them 
you know, protection, but also when we harvest them and eat them, now we get, you know, maybe four to five times more nutrition as well. <laughs> and so people don't realize this. So that's why if you don't spray things and the plant is basically forced to use its own defense systems to create more of these plant defense chemicals that then we get to eat, which are actually nutrition, antioxidants, polyphenols, and have been shown in studies to be things like anti-cancer, which I had a recent video on on my OK Raw channel. So yeah, that's what I'd say. And then of course, you know, do I buy conventional produce? Absolutely. I'm not perfect behind it. So like, like it, there's certain things that I could buy that are organic and certain things that are just not available. So for example, if I wanted to eat jackfruit, I live in Las Vegas. Okay. If I want to eat organic jackfruit, okay, yes, I probably could get it if I call my friend up in Florida, buy an organic jackfruit from him. He could ship it to me. He'd probably charge me $2 a pound, maybe $3 a pound for the fruit, and then I have to pay another $20 for shipping. I'm not that rich. <laughs> so I could go to the local store here where they import jackfruit, not organic, it's conventional, for $0.50 cents a pound when it's on sale, right? Okay. And I'll buy it and eat it because I love my jackfruit. <laughs> but... So, you know, I, I try to minimize my consumption of, um, you know, conventional food, but I will buy it in some instances if they're on the clean 15 list or if the quality would be significantly better organic. So, for example, I mean, I hate to diss on organic food, but it's rare to get really good organic mangoes unless they're the California keep mangoes that are just coming into season now, mm. usually for sale at Whole Foods, because they're the organic mangoes. They're not really well produced in foreign countries, and they then they pick them way too early, and then they just never really ripen up or get sweet. Whereas conventional mangoes, like they're usually usually way better. Like they ripen up better, or they're way sweeter and stuff. So like this week, I bought conventional mangoes from Mexico. Keats actually, they're really good. Well, they could be better, but I'm waiting for the California ones. I mean, those those cost a lot more. So. You know, it really just depends, like all my leafy greens, it's rare that I'll buy non-organic leafy greens unless it's from like a farmer at the farmer's market that I'll question and ask him what he's spraying on his crops. Uh, but generally, uh, I'll buy maybe maybe some fruits that are conventional. But if I if I could buy it organic, then of course I'm buying, I'm going to buy it organic. And and are they honest with you when you uh, when you ask them, what are you spraying on your crops? Do you, do you feel like you're getting a straight answer? It depends. So, I mean, besides just asking them, I also am using my perception and looking. So, I mean, it's unfortunate that depending where you are in the country, um, you know, that, that some people at farmer's markets are simply just reselling produce and they're not even the growers. Okay. So, I mean, that, that happens to the farmer's markets here in Las Vegas, whereas most people selling produce, the farmer's markets are just basically buying wholesale produce and reselling it as if they grew it and trying to like live that charade. States like California have laws against that, actually, and you shouldn't be doing that if you're in California, although I still see it happen. And I could tell what I know what, can, you know, just like industrial produce looks like. They're all symmetrical. They're all even looking. Sometimes they have coatings on them, the way they're cut off the plant and how they've deteriorated at the stem. Hmm. So and then so like even if I ask them what, what I'll ask them what you sprayed on it and then, you know, I want to see how they answer. And then I ask them, hey, what are your fertilizer practices? Like, hey, can I come visit your farm? You know, these are all indicators. Like if they don't want you to visit the farm, you know, they make some crappy answer up on some things that sound shady. I'll just go to the next guy. But then also could look at the quality and then I ask him to try it. Not that I could taste any pesticides, but it's also good besides just the pesticide residue, but to have something really good quality, you know, okay, like have it taste well, better and taste more, not just sweet, like it, it specifically for fruit, but like have like a flavored depth, right? Okay. Um, yes, I, I I totally agree with this. I've been saying this myself. We we need to sound the alarms. Um, the the level of quality of produce in in America it is shocking, and and we can talk all day about the benefits of superfoods and raw foods, but the when when they're not getting the soil quality, the phytonutrients are not getting into those plants, and then we're left with this subpar uh, product and, and you wonder why people don't get excited about fruits and vegetables. I mean, the stuff in the supermarkets is, you know, it's, it's sad. And so um, listen to what John's saying. Um, what about one of the ways you can get around this is making your own. What would you say to the person who's intimidated by gardening, um, you know, and, and 
and thinks, I, I don't know if I can do it. It sounds like a lot of work or, you know, what would you say to that person? You know, I mean, this garden didn't grow this big overnight. And, you know, I started like literally just growing a few plants in my backyard until I converted my whole front yard in California to grow. So it's like, you don't have to grow a ton of stuff like I do. You just grow one thing, right? I, I helped my ex-girlfriend, you know, to grow food on her patio. I got her a little arrow garden so okay. she could grow indoors. I mean, yes. She didn't even... have, a, she, she didn't have a, a backyard with a, with ground? Not at all. She just, she was okay. living in an apartment, actually. Actually, she was in Austin because actually she was living in Austin. So I'd go out there like every month um, to visit her. But uh, yeah, and we started, a, and I have videos on my Growing Your Greens channel where I, I helped her start like a little, you know, it was like a little thing you could get at Home Depot, a little self-watering, you know, raised bed container. It was like, was it like maybe two feet by two feet, if that? And, you know, you could just start off with something really small. You could grow some food in a pot. I mean, even even easier than those, I'd recommend actually just sprouting some some seeds in your in your house to grow sprouts, you know, right? broccoli sprouts. You could also grow microgreens if you want to get more hardcore. I would say sprouts are way more beneficial than microgreens because they're just a lot easier to grow and you could you could do them a lot faster. Microgreens are more sexy, <laughs> but they in involve a lot more equipment and, and investment. Okay. Okay. So, uh, um, it's, it's easier than you think. Um, and in fact, and this is what I learned gardening is that it's amazing how these things want to grow and they want to thrive. And all you have to do is give them a little bit of love, a little bit of attention and, and nature does the rest. And so, um, you know, make a commitment, um, and go to growing your greens. Uh, that's, that's John's YouTube page. And he has tons of videos about how easy it is whether you have a backyard or not, um, to experience the the difference of the food that it's it's grown right there, it's alive, it's electrical, um, it's amazing. Um, so so what, John? What would you, what advice would you have to somebody who, let's say they're in a space like you were at when you were in that in that hospital bed, or you just got back home after that, or someone who they don't they don't feel good they feel like if i only just had my health my energy maybe they're not in terrible dire straits but maybe they feel like ah you know i'm at like 70 percent of how i used to feel i just i don't have the energy i used to the youthfulness and i want to get there uh but i'm just i'm I'm struggling i'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what advice should you have to someone who wants to get healthier um how 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 to get there what what would you tell that person i mean there's many ways to to get healthier i mean i would i would always start with the easiest so i mean the easiest is just make sure you get enough sleep because we forget that sleep is a very critical component of health i mean at least you should shoot for like seven hours of sleep i would say and i mean just try to stop eating a couple hours before bed and then just Make sure your room is completely black. There's no LED lights or anything. I mean, I have whole videos where I discuss all the techniques I use to get better sleep because that, I mean, that could just improve your diet. That can improve your health right there without even changing your diet, right? Of course, another thing is exercise. And there's all these different pillars of health. And sometimes we fail to forget that, you know, that, you know, our, our health is not just about the food. You know, also, I mean, if you're stressed, constantly stressed out because you have a, a partner or a job that's stressing you out, maybe you need to reevaluate your your partner or job situation, right? And because maybe that is really not going to allow you to get to the next level because you have a constant stress. Like one of the things I heard from a friend of mine is like, you know, he got rid of his girlfriend when he went raw vegan and he was a lot healthy because of that because she would always stress him out. <laughs> so we, we can't forget about these things that are not even connected with the diet. And of course, then Another thing we should, of course, look at is the diet and what are you eating, right? There are, I, I like to teach a process called good, better, best, right? And, and that's a process I think that could help so many people. I didn't come up with this. I probably learned it from somebody out of forget now. But basically, you just want to do a little bit better than what you're doing now, right? You don't have to like go 100% raw. You don't have to go on a 40-day juice fast, like some proponents would say. I'm not, I'm not a big believer of that because I think you could do those things and you could get some great results, but then you could crash and burn. I, I mean, I sell juicers. I'm the number one juicer expert. And I see so many people go on juice fasts only to regain the weight later. 
to not stick to the program that they're on because they don't have, whether it's the support, whether it's they just can't do this cold turkey stuff, I recommend a slow and moderate approach, right? To like you take one step and you continue to take one step, one step, one step for the whole entire year. So you're not just taking this massive leap and then you fall off the cliff, right? So, I mean, just like I started, you know, I was glad I started getting into raw foods by juicing because when you juice fruits and vegetables fresh, <laughs> you have a raw food, you know, and especially I recommend pre predominantly juicing vegetables with enough fruit right. to make it palatable. You know, fruit is so delicious on its own, unless you have a fruit that's just not perfectly ripened and is not sweet and is not good. Then I'll juice those, of course, and I'll add in other vegetables. But fruit, you, we can, we're, we're, we're designed as frugivores. We can digest fruit very easily. So mm. we should just eat our fruits or I would recommend vacuum blending them. Um, but if you want to juice, we are not designed necessarily to extract all the nutrients out of carrots. That's why there are published studies showing that instead of eating carrots, if you cook carrots, you get more beta carotene out of the carrots because the cooking breaks open the cell wall. I don't necessarily recommend cooking to get your beta carotene. I would recommend actually juicing them to keep them raw to get your beta carotene before you cook them. However, I still I, I will heat process some carrots in the instant pot steamed. That being said, I prefer to juice them before I would even steam them. So we're not we're not made to really digest and get nutrients out of hard root vegetables or even leafy greens unless you chew them really well. And then even then, they're not optimally liberated from some of the fibrous cell walls. So that's why I really love juicing. So number one, concentrate some of the nutrients out of the roots, the greens, and the shoots or stem vegetables, as I like to call it, so that you could get them into like, you know, this, this quart of juice has about four pounds of produce in it. This will also allow you to crank up your amount of produce, especially important if you're eating industrial produce that has lower nutrition quality and less nutrients than it did just 30 years ago. So I think that's why juicing is really beneficial. And I mean, like I started and mentioned earlier, is just start by, instead of eating your breakfast, drink a juice. I don't care if you want to have a celery juice like some people out there claim, or you want to have a straight leaf lettuce leaf juice, romaine lettuce I would I would rather drink straight romaine leaf juice instead of celery juice myself um, or have a mixed juice with different kinds of leaves and roots. You know, things like uh, the purple sweet potatoes are excellent to juice along with carrots, uh, beets, things like jicama, you know, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Don't I don't I, and like the the like the sweet potatoes. You can eat those raw. They're not the most uh, delicious because they do have some, you know, starch stuff in it. Um, but when you juice, you, it kind of makes like a, a creaminess to it because the starch granules are kind of broken down a whole bunch. Um, I don't necessarily like juicing regular sweet potatoes, but they are sweeter actually than the purples. The purples tend to be not as sweet, but they're a lot more nutritious. So that's what I'd say. I'd say, you know, focus on the sleep, get some exercise. And then I'd just say, get a juice in a day. And I mean, just drink your juice. And then if you still got to eat your breakfast, yeah, a couple hours later, eat your breakfast. But at least now you're offsetting a lot of, especially the junk food, because most people eat for breakfast is arable. They're not eating a fruit meal for breakfast. They're using bacon and eggs, a McMuffin sandwich. I don't know, cereal, dried cereal with, you know, crappy store-bought plant milk or even worse, animal milks, right? Instead, drink your fruits and vegetables. You could get four pounds in you first meal of the day by juicing a quart. Wow, wow. And, um, and if you need recommendations on juicing equipment and blending equipment um john has been at this for a long long time has done more homework on this than anyone so he he's his youtube channel is discount juicers discountjuicers.com um i want to ask john about the texas fruit festival but i was reminded i almost forgot to ask you about pro uh, uh microbiome testing this is something that i've seen your your work on and investigation into Talk to the listener a little bit about microbiome testing um, and, and what, what can we learn about that? Sure. So when I got into the raw foods diet, you know, the microbiome was not really even discovered yet, actually, so which is kind of crazy. And so this is relatively a new thing. So consequently, if I got into raw foods and the microbiome was not discovered, everybody that had come before me had not known about raw, okay. about the microbiome either. And all the raw food books and raw food information did not consider the microbiome when they formed 
their teachings and i think well, this is a the really natural hygiene all the natural hygiene and all that going back uh did not consider the microbiome because it was not discovered yet nobody even knew about it so you know what i believe my personal belief is that with the information they had natural hygiene and you know the raw foods diet made a lot of sense i'm not going to disagree with that but now hey let's take some of the new information in and let's kind of modify what we're doing and see hey is the raw food diet optimal for the microbiome and i'm not going to say it is not i'm going to say in my case it definitely was not I, I mean i believe that like the raw food diet is the best and i'm like when i got my microbiome my first microbiome test i sent it in i'm like yeah mine's gonna kick ass i'm raw vegan screw everybody else i'm i'm kicking ass because i got the best diet this is what we're supposed to eat and i got my test results back and it wasn't it wasn't wow. where i would like it to see, like it to be or where I thought it should be. Uh, meanwhile, I, I will say that I have had raw food friends that have also sent in their tests and some of them have gotten near perfect scores. Huh. So this is very variable. It depends on the person, depends on if they're breastfed, if they're vaginally birthed, their environment, if they get enough sleep, their exercise amount, and of course also what we eat, right? Um, I, I really would love to see more microbiome tests by 100% fruitarians and people that eat a very high fruit diet without a lot of vegetables. My personal opinion is that, you know, they're not going to be the best results, but maybe I'll be surprised because, I mean, the experts in the microbiome space and published studies say you want we want to eat 30, 30 different kinds of plant foods and every different kind of plant food has different kinds of fibers and phytonutrients that feed our microbiome differently. So that's really kind of the rabbit hole that I've been running down into recently because I want to I want to optimize my microbiome because I, I don't want to like live a raw food diet. I mean, the reason why I do a raw food diet is not just to say say I'm raw is because I thought it was the healthiest diet. And when I learned that <laughs> maybe it isn't the healthiest diet, maybe I need to do something a bit differently. I'm not going to stick on this raw food ship that, in my opinion, is not necessarily sinking, but, you know, it, is not the best for me. And now, maybe it is for some people. I'm not going to say that. But I'm going to say for me and my body, my microbiome, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't where I wanted to be. So that's why I've, I've, I've made some changes. So I think that people should get a microbiome test. Now, I'll say the science is not perfect yet. They don't know everything. But there's a few commonalities. When you get a microbiome test, which is about $100, uh, you send it in and they basically analyze your poop um, for the different microbes in there. Or the metabolites so then you could kind of get a picture of what what bacteria is in your gut and they have determined that in general the greater diversity of the commensal and the, and the beneficial bacteria in your gut you know the more resilience you will have and the better health outcome you will have wow um, they don't know all the different levels of each one should be exactly but generally greater diversity means better health outcomes so for example i've had raw vegan friends that die of pneumonia now, I'm not going to say if they had a better microbiome, could they have could they have not gotten the micro not the not get the pneumonia and have died? And mm. I would say yes, because there are studies that show, you know, certain bacteria in a microbiome can help you prevent prevent you from getting pneumonia. I mean, another raw vegan I know lost his life from sepsis. Once again, oh. there's studies showing that there's microbes in your gut that can help prevent you from getting sepsis, right? I mean, clearly, I have a video where I talk about the uh, Cermicesis boulardii, which when cholera was going around in Asia years ago, people that had the Cermicesis boulardii did not get the cholera disease, right? I mean, this, is, this, is, this was observed and proven in science. And mm. so, like, I make a fermented drink out of pasteurized fruit juice um, with the Cermicesis boulardii, but then I turn it into ferment to basically drastically reduce... The sugar, because the bacteria is eaten, the bacteria count just explodes. It's a little bit bubbly and carbonated, maybe a tiny bit alcoholic. And then I drink it. So now I'm getting this bacteria in me that has been shown to be preventative against the cholera disease and what other diseases. And is it going to help against E. coli, which actually studies show that it can. So then you won't, you'd be less prone to getting E. coli if you're eating cantaloupes that are conventionally grown on, you know, manure that has E. coli contamination. I mean, and it's like these these kind of more deep thinking that, of course, a lot of the raw vegan dogma, they'll never talk about. I mean, once again, I'm doing this for my health. My life is dedicated to looking up studies, making myself crazy, creating content to share what I'm learning. If people want to listen or even care or they just think I'm some raw food kook, I think I'm doing this a very pragmatic way personally 
because I want to, you know, I'm doing this for my health because once again, I mean, as sad as it is to say, at some point, I'm still here to ensure I don't end up in the hospital again. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, John, do you have a video where you go into detail about the microbiome testing, where to get it, how to do it? Absolutely. So I have a video where I we'll, show we'll, how we'll to do to it. it. We'll link to it. On and that. then I actually share my microbiome results. So I get the, the you, it's basically a company I use called Ombre. Now there's other companies out there and I use uh, some other companies, but Ombre is a good starting point for most people because they'll give you that you could download your data and then you could upload it to another company called Biomesite in the U, in the UK, which then will analyze the data significantly better than, than, um, than Ombre would. And you could be able to see like your short chain fatty acid production for example you know you could see if you're producing enough dopamine it's it's very very interesting uh it, data that you could get from that and and it may they'll make dietary suggestions some of which i i probably would not take but you know some of them you might want to take i mean the other thing that we learned about the microbiome because still there's so much that's not learned yet number one is we want to have diversity the only way to get the, well one of the ways to get diversity is increase the diversity of the foods you're eating because every different food you're eating is going to feed different bacteria number one number two the other thing we know is that there are keystone foundational species in our gut microbiome, and we want to have those keystone species in place because, you know, and it's it's a, it's like your gut microbiome is like an ecosystem. It's like a forest, right? And like in the forest, there's all different kinds of creatures. This little creature eats this creature, eats this creature, and if you get too many foxes, right? then the whole system's like out of balance. So we really right. want to balance our microbiome. And I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not the microbiome expert, but what I'll say is that if you, I think, for example, eating too much fruit will imbalance your microbiome. The other thing I'll say is that I've seen some of my, my close friends, they've gotten microbiome tests, long-term raw fooders, not, not short-term raw fooders. I'm talking like 25 plus years. And some of their microbiome tests were maybe a little bit not as good as mine or maybe a little bit better than mine, but they still weren't, where i believe they should be hmm. and so and wow. so I, I don't i mean i wish they did a study i hope somebody does a study with raw vegan microbiomes and then how to how to get them to dial in right i think that my personal opinion is at present time a lot of the raw vegans can make enough uh like uh acetate and propionate but we're not making enough butyrate which is i mean that's a whole different topic but hmm. and so like i'm trying to eat foods and increase my butyrate production because that's actually very critical for like, you know, gut permeability and some other things, but yeah. Okay. And I have what's, a video what, down below title? where I go into this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What's the title of that video? And we'll, we'll post it here below as well. Uh, I don't know. Just, or, just go on YouTube and do raw vegan microbiome and my video will come up. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll post it in the, um, in the below work. Um, John Kohler, it's from his okay raw YouTube channel. Um, John is someone that I see out there putting in a lot of work and a lot of investigation and a lot of research and a lot of dedication for um, decades now of sharing this information uh, with people, um, someone with a lot of heart um, to help people um, and someone that we're very excited to have be a part of Texas Fruit Festival. Um, he's going to be down there for that weekend um, and unofficially four days, Friday through Monday, we're going to be having a lot of cool activities and events if you want to meet john um he has a, a special um presentation he's going to share with us as well john what are you most excited for um about texas fruit festival you know it's been years david since i've been to a fruit festival so i'm excited just to connect back with the community and people that are living this lifestyle and you know I think that's the most important thing. I think events like yours, man, like really bring people together. I mean, we're all so disconnected, unfortunately, in our connected world with devices and internet. People are watching on their phones or laptops or computers right now. And I think there's n nothing can take the place of face-to-face -face connection with other people. I mean, people. I know people will come to your event, man, and they'll make friends for life. Maybe they yeah. all live in Austin or maybe they're from all over and they connect over the phone or Zoom or whatever afterwards. But man, I mean like a, a, a you know accountability they'll be meet accountability partners maybe somebody will even find their wife or husband i mean i don't i don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> but yeah i think that's really the funnest part and then of course of course all the information gonna be shared of course you're having a fruit festival so all the fruit that's gonna be enjoyed 
Oh my God. It, it is. It's, it's amazing. The people you'll meet it, and you'll, you'll have no idea um, what's going to happen and some of the friends you'll make. And so we're, we're so excited. We're, we're excited to spend some time with John Kohler. Um, it's a free event, Texas fruit festival.com October 19 and 20, 2024. Um, so we really hope to see you there. Um, John, we really appreciate your information and your generosity and your commitment um as we close here what um what's on your radar now um what are you working on where do you see things going um and and any any other parting thoughts to the to the listener well let's see what am i doing <laughs> well tomorrow i'm taking off for the 2024 national heirloom expo actually so that's kind of like on my radar i mean i'm just i mean in, in the end i'm really a plant geek I love different plants and I love growing new and different kinds of plants and finding out plants that are more nutritious than others. So, I mean, I think that's really on my radar. So hopefully I'll find some new varieties. I'm growing a, a cool variety of like leafy green from Vietnam this year in my garden that's growing amazing and has lots of health benefits. Um, it's always exciting when I find a new new kind of fruit or vegetable to grow. I think the other thing that's I'm really up on is the equipment, you know? So, I mean, that's really my specialty. I really specialize in not only, hey, how can we grow the most nutritious food, but then also after we grow it, how can we process it in the best ways? So I'm always looking up studies and experimenting on, you know, processing fruits and vegetables in different ways to ensure that we're going to get the most health benefit from them. And this is something that pretty much, I, I don't know, really know any other health influence or even, even plant-based doctors that discuss this too much, you know, for them, just throw stuff in the Vitamix and make a smoothie and it's healthy and yes a vitamix smoothie is healthy but hey if you vacuum blend yeah you know especially we're getting into some deeper pumps that pull out more oxygen so like a pump i just reviewed pulls out 82 percent of the oxygen you know say if you're storing like i store my juices in mason jars with these little lids wow. i suck out oxygen the dissolved oxygen out of the juice and out of the headspace before storing so now that dissolved oxygen that would normally interact with antioxidants and basically nullify them are being preserved so, I mean, this is very critical, especially when you're blending. And, and unfortunately, most raw vegans still haven't even heard about vacuum blending, which I've known about for, I think, seven years now. And wow. I, probably won't. I love it, too. I, I'm like the only only like there's very few proponents of vacuum blending, because once again, I think that even small changes, small incremental changes over a long time is going to do a lot better and a lot more, you know, beneficial, you know, I mean, you got to buy food every day, but if you make a one-time investment of a vacuum blender, now every smoothie you make for the next 15 years, depending on the vacuum blender you buy, because some of them have 15 year warranties are going to be elevated and be more nutritious just because you bought, had a one-time investment of equipment. And I think, you know, I think, I mean, it makes me sad that people are still drinking non-vacuum blended smoothies. Actually, maybe that's something I should do at my talk. I should use a i could i could just do a vacuum blending demonstration because i want people to taste the difference and i want to see in the oh. audience and people taste it like maybe some people will like the vitamix one but i i would bet money and i live in vegas and i don't gamble that most people are going to love the vacuum blended one and and not really care for the other one after after trying it i don't know so maybe, i love maybe that maybe. idea it, i i taste the difference to me it's the difference easy. is night and day it is. It's night and day, but I don't know. People don't adopt this, and all these a lot of raw vegan influencers still are just using the Vitamix. They maybe they they're too cheap. They don't want to spend the money. They just don't think it's going to make a difference. Or I mean, it was. I mean, when I saw it for the first time at the trade show, and I made a video about it at the trade show, I was like, I was like, the first time I had it, I was drank it. I was like, oh my god, this is significantly different. And I'm like, I need to have this. And like, they weren't available, so I actually had to. I had to I had to basically hack a Nutribullet so I could do vacuum blending in it before I could even buy the machine. And then I'm like, it's hard to go back. I mean, what my friend Nate Nate says, uh, once you go back, you can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John Kohler, you can see him at Texas Fruit Festival, uh, texasfruitfestival.com, free event. Come hang out with us. It's going to be a blast. Um, check out growingyourgreens.com on Instagram at growingyourgreens and the YouTube channel Growing Your Greens. If you want information about blenders and juicers, discount juicers, YouTube channel, and of course the OK Raw YouTube channel where John Kohler is doing all of his research and um, investigation. 
John, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to um, spending some time at Texas Fruit Festival together. All right. Thank you, David. I'm looking forward to it also. For more right. information, please follow at Rapid Regeneration or visit rapidregeneration.com.